Good morning. Who's ready to talk about feelings? <laughs> oh, I'm just kidding. Actually, I'm not. We're totally going to talk about feelings right now. Um, so, as you know, my name is Jen, and I'm here to talk to you about emotional safety. So let's start doing that. So what is emotional safety? <clears throat> well, I think that's a terrible question. I mean, to ask that question presupposes that in a room of maybe the smartest, most talented technologists gathered at this very moment, that they don't understand why the way a person feels wouldn't be important while they're at work. That the way a person feels doesn't have any sort of impact on their work. Could that be true? Well, statistics tell us a story. According to the World Health Organization in 2012, so two years ago, the leading causes of death in high to upper middle income countries, so think like here in the US and in the EU, the leading causes of death were heart disease, stroke, and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD. So that's things like chronic bronchitis or emphysema. In 2012, 265,000 people died from heart attacks or heart disease. 221,000 people died from strokes, and 81,000 people died from COPD. Contributing factors to most of these preventable conditions were things like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, conditions in which stress can be a major contributor. And in 2012, over half a million people lost their lives because of it. And that might not seem like a lot of people, but think about it in this way. That's the same as nearly everyone in the city of Portland dying within a year. Just one year. How can this be, you're asking yourself right now? Surely the stress that those people experience in their jobs is not the one that I experience in mine. They must be like crazy Oprah levels of busy and overwhelmed and stressed out to the complete max. That could be, but I think it's far more likely that the stresses they were experiencing are the same that are now considered to be normal work stress experiences. Explain this to me, Jen, you're saying? Well, okay, that's totally why I'm here, so. Welcome to the polyvagal theory. Don't worry, it's a quick trip. Oh, wait a second. This is gonna make it more official. <clears throat> oh. Oh no, I knew this was gonna happen. Okay. Feeling official? Let's take a look. Oh, gross. <laughs> Ugh. So basically, in the polyvagal system, your autonomic nervous system, or I'm going to call it the ANS because I totally love abreaves, it's the system that's taking in all of the stimulus that you're experiencing right now. It controls a lot of the things that you're doing automatically. Get it? Autonomic? Automatic? Okay. Um, so it's controlling the things you're doing automatically, like breathing or blinking without you even thinking. And this involuntary support system is a wonderful feature of the human body. However, one of its central bosses is this vagus nerve that's part of your brainstem. Like, I know, it's gross. Um, and it's connected to all of your crucial inner, element, ele inner elements, bleh, like your heart and respiratory and gastrointestinal tracts. All those guys. <clears throat> the polyvagal theory suggests that the vagus nerve triggers these crucial systems in three different ways via information gleaned by your ANS without your control or your knowing. You've all heard of fight or flight before, right? Those survival type instincts? Well, your ANS is constantly scanning your environment all around you to determine what your current mode of survival should be. There are three modes of survival. Safety, danger, and too late, basically. Just kidding, the last one is life threat. You guys can see that. 
So let's talk about safety mode. When your nervous system determines that you are safe, you are operating at your body's optimum mental and emotional levels. Your ANS goes into rest and digest mode, which basically means that it's operating at its full capacity so that you don't have to consciously think about how on all of your systems are. They just are. This is the level that you want to be at to do your best work. All of your work. Danger mode! It's not really as cool as it sounds. When you're exposed to danger, unconsciously your body goes into hyperdrive. Your heart rate increases, your ANS jumps into action, and it limits the rest of your system's ability in order to keenly focus on the danger. And to do this, it floods your system with norepinephrine, which is a fun hormone that causes vigilant concentration. Additionally, in danger mode, you're more prone to unexpected bouts of rage or panic. And this is the fight or flight of the fight or flight impulse. And it's all happening subconsciously, but your body is preparing you for one of those two outcomes. And last, life threat mode. When your ANS perceives a life threat, it shuts everything down. Your heart rate actually decreases. Your muscles tense and ready for action. That will most likely never come. Does anybody here experience back or neck pain from being stressed at work? That's the result of tension that never gets discharged. In life threat mode, you can't hear reason. This is the freeze mode of fight, flight, or freeze. And based on the information that the ANS is giving to the vagus nerve, your body is constantly but unconsciously occupying one of those three modes. For example, my body is currently in danger mode, although I can be hyperbolic, so it feels like life threat mode right now. I'm like super close to shutting down. <laughs> so, why is any of this important? Well, with the knowledge of that mini biology lesson, how is it not? Which mode do you think you're operating in right now? What about when you have an argument with someone? What mode does that look like? Which mode are you operating in when you get critical and really hard to hear, but absolutely necessary feedback? Which mode are you operating in when you're in a conflict about a really hard but important decision? Recognizing what mode you've been operating in is crucial. Because spending a prolonged length of time in danger mode or life threat mode has serious physical and mental health consequences. So here's a list of some of them. And looking at that, you're probably thinking, well, those are some normal reactions to stress, Jen. There's more. Well, things got a little bit worse. Are you ident identifying with any of those when you think about work? It's not good. Prolonged stress can even lead to drug or alcohol abuse withdrawal from social situations, or most disturbingly, in my opinion, the chronic suppression of your immune system, the very thing that's intact to keep you safe, protect your body from harm. Your body will start to suppress that. This is important. Your body craves safety. This is not about me being a woman or being in touch with my feelings more than you are. This is biological. And it is a fact that we are killing ourselves with stress. If safety first is a thing you ever heard and nodded along to or believed, this is important. To quote our intern Heather on her first day at And Yet, happy, smart people are productive, smart people. You cannot deny the existence or the importance of your feelings and the impact they have on your whole being. That's the person that you take to work every day. To do so is childish and ignorant, and it doesn't even make sense. Who would even do that anyway? Oh, that's me. But, okay, so I only did that for like the first 29 years of my life, so not that long. 
The difference between the person that I was for those 29 years and the person that I've worked so hard to become over the last two is that I've come to truly believe that everyone has value and everyone deserves respect. Because if I believe that I have value and that I deserve respect, I absolutely have to believe that of the people around me for it to be true about myself. People are the value added to everything that you do. You just have to be able to see that. And yet we say people first. And if you're lucky enough, the types of products and projects that you're working on, those will change. But the people that you work on those projects and products with, the clients that you work with, they might change too, but they might not. Regardless, people don't ever just go away. I, I hate to break it to you, but you're actually surrounded by people right now. They're all around you. And they're all around you when you're at work and at home. And people are, they're kind of here to stay. And I think that emotional safety is important because it's creating a space for people to be safe, to feel safe, to be people. Which I know that everyone here is really cool, but we, we are all, we're all people here still, if you forgot. Every person on your team, actually, every person that you come into contact with has an entire universe of contributions just waiting inside of them. Think about that. How many universes are in this room or on your team? But people will always be afraid to let that out, to take those steps. If they feel like they don't matter, because they don't feel safe. So you're asking yourself, how can I have this emotional safety thing now? Well, how can you achieve it? It, it can't be achieved. So that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. I'm totally kidding. <laughs> Emotional safety can be something that is respected. It can be something that's prioritized, that's pointed to, that's discussed. But I have to be clear that emotional safety is not a destination. Creating a safe place for your people to be people, it has to be a fluid thing because, I mean, I'm not even going to stand up here and, and try to tell you how fast things change, especially people. I do have some advice for starting to create a safer environment if you're interested in that. It's also worth pointing out that emotional safety is the responsibility of every single person. I'll get into this more in a minute, but I really want to emphasize that it's truly a personal responsibility. But I think more importantly, leaders, and I know you're here, you've taken up the mantle of leading people, like it or not. Creating emotional safety is your responsibility. People, right now, they could be sitting at the same table as you. They're looking to you to show them that they can be safe with you. They just need to see it to believe it. Don't keep them waiting. You will not regret it. It will improve the health of your team tenfold. I can guarantee it. I have seen it. I have lived it. I know that there are many of you who didn't set out to be leaders, and hearing this just adds to the list of things that are already frustrating you. I get discouraged too, quite easily, when I discover the limits of my understanding about what it means for me to lead. If you are a people-first person, if you find yourself shying away from leading because of the challenges it presents, because of so many unanswered questions, then we need you. I'm a person who cares about other people, but I need encouragement to keep leading. 
if you feel like you need encouragement too, or you feel like you have some to offer, please check this out. My team at Andiat and I are going to very soon announce a new endeavor called Leadershipy. It's early, and I can't say much more than what I've already said now, but if these feelings I'm describing resonate with you, then we really need you. So go to leadershipy.com to check that out. And if you're not a leader, or you work alone, I think emotional safety is still worth paying attention to because it will improve the quality of your relationships, working or otherwise, and the quality of your life. And it's something you should expect from your leaders. So, how to do this? I'll tell you guys where I started. First and foremost, figuring out a way to understand and identify your emotions is crucial. From what I hear, it's like learning a programming language. I don't know any of them. What I did to start educating myself was read. I wanted to logically understand these emotion things and figure out what that meant for me. Um, a book that I read that helped change my life was called Positive Intelligence by Shirzad Shamin. Uh, after that, I started going to counseling. And, ooh, I said a counseling stigma word. But uh, I think the stigma of the girl that was feeling like a crazy person every day at work and couldn't manage her emotions and didn't have the tools or the ability to have a dialogue about what was going on, I think that's a way worse stigma than the person that passionately goes after improving their mental health in their situation. So I'm comfortable with that stigma. Um, and... I think one of the most important things you can do to educate yourself is to start practicing having uncomfortable conversations. And I don't mean that you're having conversations with the intent to make someone feel uncomfortable. Um, but uh, emotional safety is about being able to talk to people about your emotions. And if you don't know how to do that, you need to start practicing having those conversations. And I've done that with my team. Trust was built as a result of that. So I would encourage you to look into that. Reactions, when I talk about emotional safety, people usually feel like it will make the workplace murky. And that's absolutely false. <sighs> so much of learning about mental health is understanding the absolute necessity for boundaries. Um, and learning to identify your personal boundaries is key. What are boundaries? Well, I actually can't tell you that because everybody's are different. But I can lead you in the direction of a book by Henry Cloud called Boundaries. And this dude, he knows stuff. So if you take one thing away from this talk, let it be the mention of this book. Because this book will definitely help you clarify. But I'll give you a couple of my boundaries that I've set for an example. The first one is that I don't ever talk about anything related to a sexual nature at work. There's just too much there that can offend people, and it's never, ever, never, ever, never, 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 ever worth it. Uh, another hard boundary that I've had to set for myself is that if I'm leading a group of my teammates, I won't vent about one of them to anybody else in that group. And it can be hard to do. I have learned this by screwing it up. So I know now it's a valuable thing I've learned. I've set that boundary. The last thing I would suggest is learning to move toward conflict. And not in a way that's aggressive or that you are wanting to thrive off of conflict, but moving toward it with the intention to resolve the intention to solve the problem. And this is maybe the hardest thing in the world to do, for me at least, because it requires putting your personal things aside, not being triggered by the circumstances of the conflict. It requires learning to manage your emotions, recognizing what survival mode you're in, being able to take all of that into account and be able to productively and proactively work through the problem that the conflict presents. So obviously, there needs to be a plug for nonviolent communication here. Oh, 
I added the N this morning. It said nonviolent communication. <clears throat> So Dr. Marshall Rosenberg wrote this wonderful book, which essentially gives you insight into conflict and a framework for how to begin to productively engage in conflict and working through it. So I definitely recommend checking the book, but I want to give you that framework as well. So this is the structure, which is aimed at giving people a template to express both their feelings and their needs in a productive way. So I'll give you an example. Uh, when I see you take all of the credit for that site, I feel hurt because I worked on that too. And I need to feel like my, con my contribution was valued. So can we talk about this? Would be one way to start having a conversation. <sighs> Good question. I can tell you why I care about this. That is Mila, and she is very proud of her muscles. <laughs> and I want her to be strong, especially in all of the ways that I am weak. I've been trying to demonstrate principles and tools that I've been learning to my five-year-old so that by the time she's 29, she doesn't have to do all of the heavy lifting that I'm doing now. It will already be ingrained in her, and she'll be like, a million light years ahead of where I am in this moment, I'll be learning from her when she's my age. But I believe just as importantly, gaining a perspective on emotional safety teaches you empathy. Emotional researchers generally define empathy as the ability to sense other people's emotions, coupled with the ability to imagine what someone else must be thinking or feeling. So you see, empathy is different from sympathy in that you don't pity the other person for their circumstances, but instead you take on their circumstances, put yourself in their place, and truly try to navigate their thoughts and feelings. Empathy is hard work. It requires emotional endurance. It requires you to do the work of gaining additional perspectives. So I'll tell you a story about empathy. <sighs> it's a hard one to tell, too. Recently, I was in a situation where a male teammate disagreed with a decision that I had made and suggested that my tone regarding the situation needed to be addressed. My tone. I was pissed. I was so instantly pissed off, like a lot, a lot of being pissed off. <laughs> I felt that if the same argument had been had between two men, that there would be absolutely no way that tone would be brought into that conversation at all. I stewed about this for two days. I wanted to summon the fury of a thousand gens and just write this guy off as being small-minded and sexist and I just didn't want to deal with him. But for all of the angry things that I wanted, I knew something had to happen. I had a hard time seeing what. Begrudgingly, I knew that somewhere in the back of me, there was this tiny quiet voice from Cascadia JS saying, something about personal growth. And I'm not sure what that was. It was really hard to hear over the anger. Fortunately, I had the support of others on my team to help me through the decisions that lay before me because I, I could take the path that led to more conflict and engendered arguments and, and indulge those triggers. Or I could engage in problem solving and see that action for what it was and try to look at the problem from a different perspective. And it was hard. It, it didn't come to me immediately or it never came to me on my own. I had to ask for help. I brought another person in, a neutral third party, to mediate a face-to-face -face meeting with my other teammate. And it was super uncomfortable. I had a stomach ache that whole morning. But out of that meeting 
came wonderful things. We were both able to hear each other and get the context of where the other person was coming from. And it's worth noting that our notorious exchange took place over, t over instant message. So it's fair to say that we were both reading way different things than the other person had been typing. We both apologized. And with the tension nearly evaporating, I was able to commit to helping this man, this other person in the situation, my teammate, improve so that we could achieve our shared goal together and not find ourselves in the situation again. Only with empathy were we both able to look at the situation and recognize that what was needed wasn't damning that other person, but committing that we can both do better. I chose the path of emotional safety, not just for me, but for both of us. I'm saying this because the person involved is my collaborator on a project that I am leading, which is why I feel I have a greater responsibility for his emotional safety and why I'm holding myself to this standard. And at this point in the story, I want to tell you that we lived happily ever after and the project was great and we continued to collaborate evenly and it was awesome. But the truth is that Immediately, as in a week later, I turned around and screwed it all up. Another situation happened between us. That was a thing that we had spoke about in that meeting. Happened, and it just it pissed me off again. And this time, absolutely zero emotional safety zen came to me. I got so angry. I just said, screw it and I indulged my triggers, and I acted passively aggressively towards my teammate, and just fail wailed everywhere all over the place for a week. And all of this was directed at a guy I had committed to teaming up with, say, a week ago, to do better. Fortunately, I have trusted teammates who reminded me of my commitment who kept me accountable to my standards and forced me to have a face-to-face -face with this teammate. And it was horrible. <laughs> but you know what I did? I mean, I cried. I cried a lot. I knew I failed. I failed him. I failed you. I felt like emotional safety is too hard, and how can I even be all about this if I can't keep myself together over one conflict? How am I any different from anyone else? But in that meeting, I owned my failures, and I owned my fears and my hopes. I was able to admit to all of the people in that meeting my failure, and I apologized because I think if there's anything that makes, it, makes me different, it's that I do care and I do want to get this right. Emotional safety is really hard and I'm not here to tell you that it's not. You won't always get it right and you definitely won't be able to do that alone. Emotional safety is a personal responsibility that can be reinforced by good leaders. So yes, I truly believe empathy is a quality every person can be taught that will improve the quality of their life significantly. It'll improve the quality of their interactions, the quality of their conversations. I know it will improve the quality of their conflicts and their relationships. I'm just gonna say this. I haven't said it before, but it's important. Feelings are important to me. No one deserves to feel like crap. And we all have, we all know how that feels. Our bodies, our bodies unconsciously crave safety. Everyone wants to feel good, and I believe that everyone wants to do good. Statistics tell us a story, but I think we can start a better one. 
Thank you.